The scripture reading this morning is taken from Acts chapter 7, verses 37 to 43. Acts chapter 7, 37 to 43. <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> this uh, takes place uh, when Stephen was martyred, and he was uh, <clears throat> before that happened. He uh, preached to the people there, the Jews there, and the, the ones that were uh, trying to uh, kill him. And it's about uh, partway through his uh, his sermon, verse thirty-seven. <clears throat> This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As far as this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of, become of him. And they made a calf in those days, <clears throat> offered sacrifices to the idol, rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Amen. Well, good morning. So this past week, what have you been watching? Anyone watch the Olympics? I see some heads nodding. Mary does. Mary does. I occasionally, occasionally look in. Maybe don't watch the events when they take place, but maybe watch some of the events after the fact. Well, the Canadian women's soccer team has been eliminated. Question is, should they even play? There was an ethical scandal. So I have an article, all kinds of articles, okay, on ethical acts in sports. For all too common. I guess I'm the problem. See, for the women's team, I designed a national program on making ethical decisions for coaches. And so coaches have to take the course I prepare and the course I teach. And I teach it primarily in the hockey environment. But I do it for 64 Olympic sports. And so before the first game began, the Canadian team had to redo a course in ethical decision-making because they failed in terms of the high standard, the drone, right? So all kinds of things are going on right now in the Olympics, whereby things are deemed to be less than ethical. Well, did anyone see the opening ceremonies? Well, sometimes the press doesn't always report everything. So here's Conver Black writing yesterday. Disgraceful Olympics, grotesque disparagement of Christianity. And so on the float, the Seine, I was there last, uh, last July, on the Seine River, there's a float. There's a parody of what's deemed to be Da Vinci's The Last Supper of Christ. And there are drag queen, queens. And there's like the apostles, right? And Jesus, well, here's the goddess or the god of wine, serving the chalice to the disciples. So Convert Black talks about the Lord's Supper as a sacred event. He said, we have a perverted farce. They reveled in the opening ceremonies in the display of so-called inclusivity. That's what was called by the person who was responsible for the display. Well, another article by Michael Higgins. The woke barbarians are here. 
he says, reminds us, the barbarians did not destroy Rome. They weren't at the gates. Rome was destroyed, morally, decay from within. And all the barons, all barons did was clean up after the fact. And so Michael Higgins is saying Western civilization is under siege today by woke barbarians. Now he talks about Canada. So the Nietzsche said, Canada, you're not immune from this. And so Higgins gives the example in Canada, 85 Catholic and other churches and church properties have been set on fire or vandalized since May 21. Well, wanton excess at the Olympics. Narcissism, exhibition, exhibitionism, pornography, all in the parody of Christ and the Lord's Supper. Interesting, Higgins ends by saying, by quoting Paul in Philippians, he says in the National Post article, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is a good re repute, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Raymond de Sousa writes, insulting Christians, that was the whole point of the parody. See, the unofficial anthem of the Olympics, and I like the song, but I don't describe the lyrics, John Lennon, imagine. See, don't you find country after country being honored and parading by and being announced? See, Lennon says, imagine there are no countries. <laughs> imagine if you try. It's easy, he says. But he also says, imagine that there's no religion. See, John Lennon's anthem played at the Olympics is a hymn dedicated to atheism. Well, I appreciate Ray sending me the hymns last night because the hymn we just sang really is our lesson. In fact, maybe the hymn Reyes could take the place of the lesson that I present. See, 844 begins by saying, guide me. Who's going to guide us? Who's going to lead the parade? Who's going to give us our marching orders, our ethics? Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Pilgrim <laughs> through this promise through this barren land, I guess we want to get the promised land, but pilgrim through this barren land. Bear me through the swelling current. Well, I've run the Seine, I've sailed on the Seine, I haven't gone swimming in the Seine, thank goodness. Bear me through the swelling current, land me safe on Canaan's side, right? The promise given to Abraham. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. So I'm not sure if you by happenstance selected that hymn or you did that based upon my lesson, but I think that's a fitting beginning to our lesson. In fact, it's a fitting close. And number 66, praise God. Praise God from whom all of our blessings come. So I'm beginning picking up in Acts chapter 7, verse 38. We introduced some of this in the Bible class. Now, Moses, it says in verse 38 of Acts 7, as Chris was saying, this is Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin, before he becomes a martyr. He tells Israel their story because they have compartmentalized or have forgotten, or they just don't want to listen or to obey. So Moses, it says, <clears throat> was in the congregation, the assembly, which means ecclesia, the word for church, in the desert, in the wilderness. So in attendance with Moses in the congregation in the wilderness, 
are the patriarchal fathers. You might read Hebrews chapter 11. There is the angel of the presence who spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai when he received the commandments from God. And there's the people of Israel. It says, at Sinai, Moses received the living words of God. As Carson talks in the Bible class, to pass on. To pass on to Israel through the generations all the way to Acts chapter 7. And by extension, to pass on to us. Note Paul, the gospel Paul passes on to us. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says, Brethren, I want to remind you, just like Moses, of the gospel. The gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. But notice it's conditional if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you believe in vain. For what I received from God, I pass on to you. As the first importance, he says. See, what's the gospel? Historically, theologically, Christ died for our sins. According to the written word, according to the scripture. And that he was buried. And that he was raised the third day. According to the living word, the scriptures. And then Paul talks about five of the ten known resurrected appearances of Jesus. Well, in Bible class, Larry mentioned the uh, Ten Commandments being made mandatory imperative in schools in Louisiana. See, they have to display in big letters the Ten Commandments in every classroom in Louisiana from kindergarten through university in publicly supported schools. But the governor says this is not merely a religious act. He says it has historical significance. The Ten Commandments are our foundational documents for our state and our national government. The displays were part of the American public educational system for, he says, three centuries. And this has been copied by Texas, Oklahoma, and Utah. They're proposing the same thing. Well, Michael Korn writes in response to this, not just the Ten Commandments to be posted or published. He says, put the gospel of Christ ahead of the Mosaic Law. Korn says, the Ten Commandments are vital in Christian thought, but not the center. And he referenced the great command, right? Love God, that's central, with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Then he goes further, Corey. He says, well, we could post also the Beatitudes. Blessed are. See, wouldn't that be good as well? See, we're keeping not just the old, but something of the new before us. But then he says, we don't need posters or words per se. That's okay. We need witness and action. Christ, Christianity, is best represented by people living and following Jesus. I think he's right on there, right? So verse 39. Stephen reminds his listeners, but, see, but our fathers. Our fathers refused to obey. Our fathers rejected Moses, his leadership, the commandments. They rejected God 
himself. Note, Stephen is charged with blasphemy. But who charges him? The descendants of those who rejected Moses now rejected Stephen, and they rejected Jesus, a prophet like me, Jesus, the promised Messiah, the Christ. So the question becomes, verse 38, going back to 38 and 39, where is the congregation, where is the church today? See, that isn't just back there in the wilderness. Coming forward, that includes us. Is the church today in the wilderness? See, if you read further in the wilderness, the congregation, the church in the wilderness becomes a pagan church, a pagan assembly. Well, a pagan church, a pagan assembly in the Old Testament, you deny authority, the authority of Moses, the authority of God. Are there churches today and church people who deny the authority of Christ? Might they deny the Bible as the living words of God, as Moses received them, as Paul presented them? No, we might be in a cultural wilderness. That may not be a bad thing. Not in the wilderness without God. We might be in a cultural wilderness with God, honoring both Christ as the word of God and the living words given to us by God. So Paul says in Romans 8.31, I guess he asked a question, if, propositionally, God is for us, if God is with us, who could be against us? And our civilization, if they're against us, what does it really matter if God is for us, and yet God is with us. Peter Berger is a sociologist of religion, and he states, perhaps the truth, churches, for the most part, do not change culture, but tend to reflect the culture of which they're a part. See, we might wish that was different, but people are part of culture. And when they come into the church community, when they live their Christian lives, they might have a lot of excess baggage from the world that we bring along with us into our practice of Christianity. So George Barna and Frank Viola in a book entitled Pagan Christianity, Exploring the Roots of Our Christian Practice, they quote Jesus. And see, Jesus, he asked the question, why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions? See, do we have traditions? In the wide stream of Christianity, do people follow tradition? So Barna and Viola say, the institutional church has compromised with culture, with tradition, in terms of present day relevance, rather than being faithful to New Testament principles in worship and lifestyle. Now, if you're in the Bible class, that second page has a quotation I'm gonna share. And perhaps in the Bible class another time, we might look at it more intently. But John Stott, He writes a small book entitled, What Christ Thinks of the Church. It's based upon the letters to the seven churches of Asia. What Christ thinks of the church then, and what he may think of the church now. He also writes another book called, Christ the Controversialist. See, Christ didn't want controversy, but he engaged in controversy in terms of debating, discussing. 
the big issues of his day, the big issues of our day in terms of the nature of God and the nature of Christian practice. So I call this from John Stott, something called conventional religion. So in the Bible class, the second page, you have this quotation. So John Stott says, the ugly truth is we tend to avoid suffering by compromise. So we talk about suffering another time. Our moral standards, he says, are often not noticeably higher than the standards of the world. Our lives do not challenge and rebuke unbelievers by their integrity or purity or love. The world sees in us nothing to hate. As for the church, in many places, the world hardly notices it. It makes little impact on society. Its discipline is in many ways lax and its commitment half-hearted. Now, what he's talking about is his church, Anglican. That's the background. He acknowledges that, right? That may not be true of every church, but you know what? That's what I find. I am a theologian. I am a minister serving Anglican churches. So this is my church, he says. We are seldom bold to rebuke vice. We mind our own business, lest anyone should be offended. We hold our tongue so no one is embarrassed. We'll skip some. We are respectable, conventional, inoffensive, ineffective. See, that's kind of a negative, isn't it, right? He might be lamenting. Lamentation means it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> it could be different. It could be different. And so he gives a positive, right? Supposing everyone who calls themselves by the name Christ, Christ Christian, supposing we raise our standards, supposing we stopped our playing around with religion. Jesus tells parables, the children that play, they're playing a religion, they're playing church. And my family coming into church, my younger brother, my youngest brother, Craig, he'd play church. He'd play the song leader. He might play the, play the preacher. You'd act out what you saw. People play religion. Supposing we raised our standards and stopped our compromises. Supposing we proclaimed our message and tightened our discipline. Think of self-discipline. With love, but not with love, but not with fear, without fear. I tell you the result, the church would suffer. There would be an outcry, would be called puritanical, Victorian, old fashioned, unpractical, rigid. Indeed, every imaginable derogatory epithet would be called into the service of the unbelieving world. And the church would again find itself where it belongs. He says, outside the gate and in the wilderness, but not by ourselves, with God. Let me go to verse 40, if you follow along in your, in your, in your Bible. See, there's a crisis at Sinai. The fathers instructed Aaron to manufacture some gods. What they just brought out of Egypt. Weren't there miracles? Weren't there signs, wonders for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians, for Israel? This is God liberating his people. Well, you've seen God in action. Now, Aaron, manufacture some gods, some gods who will lead the way for us. Moses has just led us through the Red Sea to the foot of Sinai. So who led the liberation? Moses by himself? Was it God? And now we're close to the borders of the promised land, the promise that God made to Abraham. Some gods who will lead the way for us. What way? 
if you read the book of Acts, beginning in chapter 9, verse 2 at least, Paul talks about him recognizing and perceiving the way, and the way was Jesus Christ. They weren't called Christians yet. Later on, called Christians in Antioch, but they were known as followers of the way. And Jesus said, I am. God is the way. The fathers gave up. How long did it take from Egypt to Sinai? I don't suspect very long. Our fathers gave up on Moses, the Redeemer. Did they give up on God? They lament. As for this fellow Moses, who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Exodus 32 and verse 1. See, Moses in God's presence. And he's receiving the commandments. So verse 40 says, in their hearts, at Sinai, they had already turned back to go to Egypt. And Sam talked about that in Bible class, to go back to slavery, to go back to paganism, to go back to sin. Can we afford freedom? See, they're free. Free at last. Free at last. Is that Martin Luther King Jr., right? Free at last. See, B.F. Skinner asked the question, can we afford freedom? Title of a book. See, maybe some of us can't afford deal with freedom. And we go back to the good old days of slavery and paganism. To be free is to move onward perhaps upward with Christ. No turning back, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Freedom means responsibility. See, Jesus frequently asks someone, well, do you want me to heal you? Someone who's blind or crippled, and they're pocking the wares in the temple courtyards. You want me to heal you? Well, we think yes. But see, Jesus is asking the question because some people don't want to be healed. I have a good thing going here. If you heal me, it means accountability. It means responsibility. Freedom means being responsible, being responsible. So Paul says, the Christians, all things are yours, a long list in 1 Corinthians 3, 22 and 23, including the present. The present, all its opportunities. And you have, as God's blessing the future, with all its uncertainty. And sometimes we forget our blessings and worry about the uncertainty and forget that God is with us. So Paul gives the assurance, you are of Christ. And Christ is of God. You're in good hands. So Christians are free. Free to dedicate themselves to God as living, loving, spiritual sacrifices. That's Romans 12, verse 1. The Phillips translation says, living, loving, spiritual sacrifices as an act of intelligent worship. Like if you kind of understand, it's reasonable. It's intelligent to give yourself to God, your creator. Christians who are free in Christ are not to be burdened again by yoke of slavery. Well, who would burden us? Who would hinder us? See, it's not God. Our freedom is under the control of God's spirit, who does not make free or sport with us, does not burden us with sin. Galatians 5, 
1 and 13. Let me just uh, do one more area. See, Israel, the wilderness is on the road. Where are they going? Idolatry. They made an idol in the form of a calf. Who did that? It was Aaron. Who is Aaron? Remember Moses' spokesperson? The cool spiritual leader with Moses at the Exodus. Aaron was complicit and led Israel into sin. Exodus 32 and verse 21. So who is the greater sin? Israel? Explicit sin? Aaron? Implicit. He led them into sin. Aaron collected and refined the jewelry into an idol in the shape of a calf, the golden calf. What's an ounce of gold worth? On uh, Friday, Thursday's close, it was $2,500. U.S. for an ounce of gold. And from all the people, Aaron collected all the gold they had. Notice Exodus 32, verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> Aaron, besides the shaping of the calf, <clears throat> built an altar. He announced the festival. The people sacrificed burnt offerings, fellowship offerings, before the calf, before the altar, they sat down to eat and drink at the festival and indulge and in, got up to indulge in revelry. The Lord said to Moses, <laughs> your people have become corrupt. Quick to turn away from what I commanded. They have made themselves an idol. They have said, these images are our gods. These gods, not the God of heaven, brought us out of Egypt. I have seen, God says, these people, they are stiff-necked. That means stubborn. And that's what Stephen says about the leaders of Israel in verse 51. <clears throat> so the golden calf was worshipped with sacrifices. A symbol of prosperity, $25 an ounce. Self-satisfaction. The work of our hands. We are self-sufficient. A former member of this congregation told me a story. He worked at the seal plant. He offered a crane. And he tried to share the gospel with somebody, a pool worker at the seal plant. And the person kind of ignored him. I have no cash in my wallet. <laughs> Called up his wallet and said, I made this. I don't need Christ. I don't need God. I am self-sufficient. See, that's what Israel was saying. Notice God's response. Maybe we can't finish all of this here. God turned away. Just as Israel turned away from God. God gave them over. Over to what? To the fruit. The consequences of their idolatry. They worshipped heavenly bodies. They worshipped the creation rather than the creator. Is this today? 
See, today we have a secular religion, and in secular religion, the creation may deem to be sacred. But the creation is separated from the creator. No God. Just happenstance. We don't serve, we don't worship, we don't honor the God of creation. We honor the created order. In the wilderness, Israel worshiped stars, heavenly bodies, the god Raphan, an Egyptian god associated with the planet Saturn. They worshiped at the shrine of Moloch. Well, that's child sacrifice. So what are the consequences? Collective unbelief. That's what Stephen is talking about in the whole chapter. Disobedience, idolatry. The result for Israel is exile. So Amos 5.27 talks about exile beyond Babylon. But reading Amos, it begins with the Syrian captivity. So in the 8th century BC, you find the disappearance, the scattering of Israel, the 10 northern tribes disappear from the face of the earth as a distinct entity. Where do they go? They're dispersed. They blend in. They no longer are the 10 tribes. Then there's the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. Now, that results in the purification of Judah, the two southern tribes. And from this purified remnant will come the Messiah. See, in one chapter, Stephen is trying to tell Israel their whole history. F.F. F. Bruce, a well-known theologian, he says, God gave men up to the consequences of their settled choice. Freedom, right? We worship the shrine of freedom. God gave men up to the consequences of their settled choice. Hence, you might read, I'll just stop here and not do it all for today. Paul describes the moral choices of the first century Roman Empire. So because of that clock there, I won't continue and finish. I'll just mention this. Paul begins by saying in verse 24, God gave them over. In the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. See, the worship starts with heavenly bodies. And now here's the sexual worship of the human body and human things. There's more in verse 26 to the end. I won't go there right now. I'll just turn, if I can, to two passages to close this morning. See Romans 12, verse 2. Paul, speaking again, perhaps, to the Roman world, but speaking to Christians specifically, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test. Taste and see, Peter says. Test and approve. Prove what God's will is. It is good. It is pleasing. It's perfect. And then Ephesians will end with this. 
in chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. You were taught, see Christians, you're different, you're different. You were taught to put off the old self, which Paul further describes, graphic. Put off the old self, deceitful desires and practices, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So go back to what Michael Korn was saying. <clears throat> we can put commandments up on walls, but the great commandment is to love God with our whole being. And if we do that, it's automatic that we learn and practice love neighbors ourselves. Because we're in right relation with God, we exhibit his holiness and his holy lifestyle. We have a doxology race. Praise God, is that the hymn? Praise God. See, here's the story. Stephen gives his audience a chance to hear the story again and repent and be embraced by God. But as Rob told us, they don't do that, right? Rob talks about the murderdom, the martyrdom of Stephen. Let's stand and praise God who blesses us and gives us his salvation.